Thank you for listening to Mormon Sex Info. This episode is an archived episode and is only now becoming publicly available. Mormon Sex Info relies on contributions. To contribute, please visit mormonsex.info. And now, please enjoy this episode. Welcome to Mormon Mental Health. This is Natasha Helfer Parker. I am really glad to be having a very important conversation tonight with two of my colleagues at Symmetry Solutions, Sarah Hughes-Zabawa and Jennifer White. We're going to be talking more about issues of consent and trying to discuss ways that we can better equip ourselves as either leaders in the church or family members or supporters or allies of anyone who's had to deal with any type of sexual assault, especially given many of the uh, issues that have been in the news here lately. So I know it's a topic we've been covering a lot, and yet... As we learned from Sunday school, repetition is good and necessary in learning, and it's good to uh, to kind of review things and have different perspectives and different voices that are talking about these things. I don't want it to just be a one-time podcast type of issue. Before we get started, I would like to just, again, thank all of you who are donating to Mormon Mental Health Podcast. We have had some uptick and since I've been asking pretty regularly for donations, i very excited to keep this podcast alive. It's really been a passion of mine now for many years, but it hasn't been financially sustainable ever as a podcast on its own. So we're trying to change that. I know I often get really great comments from listeners and, you know, stating the value that they get from some of these resources. So I hope that's the case for most of you who are listening and would ask if it is the case for you to help support this effort. So there's a donate button on the page, mormonmentalhealth.org. That's very easy to subscribe or give a one-time donation. It doesn't have to be anything super big on your end. Any little bit helps. Again, if everybody who listened just even gave $1, we'd be doing really great and it would be a totally sustainable podcast. So, And some of you have actually given quite a bit uh, in the last few months. So again, I want to thank you so much for, for those efforts. Okay. So I want to give uh, an opportunity for both Sarah and Jennifer to quickly introduce themselves before we get started as far as the content. So um, Sarah, you want to go first? I'd love to. Thank you, Natasha. I am a licensed clinical social worker. I have a master's degree in social work, both from mental health practice, interpersonal practice, and community organizing and social systems, and a graduate certificate in women's studies, where I primarily focus on women's mental health and treating complex PTSD. A large portion of my clinical experience has to do with working with trauma survivors, including sexual abuse and domestic abuse survivors. Um, So this topic is incredibly important to me. I'm also a registered yoga instructor and wellness coach with Symmetry Solutions, and I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. Great. And Jennifer? I'm also a therapist and a coach with Symmetry Solutions. Um, I have my master's in social work as well, like Sarah. Um, and yeah, I've experience in kind of dealing with both sides of this. Um, I have worked in domestic violence, you know, where it's been working with the offenders to help them change. Um, as well as I'm working a lot right now with, um, victims of different types of trauma, um, you know, including, including sexual trauma and right. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we I'm so pleased to be working with both of you and you always add so much to our conversations and you know all the case consultations that we do together, etc. So thank you so much for being with me tonight and sharing of your valuable times and energies. I do apologize that my voice I think is on the outs. <laughs> I have a little bit of a sore throat and I'm also guessing, I don't necessarily feel this way, but I'm guessing that my energy is a little bit lower. So yeah, my voice is probably showcasing some of my own issues tonight. All right. So I think the main thing that we want to address that has been so concerning to so many of us has been some of the comments that were made in regards to a general conference address where this phrase of non-consensual immorality was talked about and also the responses that we saw from the church in regards to the Mormon leaks 
issue that happened now several weeks ago where we saw the church respond to allegations of sexual assault. Uh, We saw several responses from the church that came out as the weeks progressed, and we still are yet to really know of any type of actual shifts or changes or even disciplinary actions. Those are all kinds of things that that I, I don't think we will know much about or have been, you know, updated on as far as the general public. So given that, I'd like to give you each just a chance to just share a few of your concerns. We don't want to be very concern centric tonight because I feel like I've had several podcasts sharing why we're concerned about these issues. We want to be more solution focused tonight and offer some just kind of ideas or thoughts or strategies that might be helpful to be aware of instead of what we're currently seeing. But I do want to give you at least both an opportunity to share some of your initial thoughts as far as what it was like to see the responses roll out, to see what it was like to have the general conference address that happened and the reactions that we saw from clients and from commenters on social media and blogs and things of that nature. So whoever wants to go first. Hi, Will, Natasha. I think one of my primary concerns as a provider and as a clinician is always to see the responses of our clients and to see the responses of previous clients. Oftentimes, when a trauma survivor comes forward, how they are treated can be a real trigger for other survivors. It can bring up past issues. In many ways, what we know from trauma is our bodies remember our mind, body, spirit, remember. So if there are situations in the news where we see other survivors belittled or deme- or not heard or not listened to or not treated with a level of respect that survivors have come to learn to and understand through years of wellness and support and education that they deserve, it can be incredibly rewounding re-triggering, re-traumatizing. And so I think my personal reaction was one of devastation with the awareness of what this would mean to other survivors, to watch them respond to how they're viewing an institution that many of which of my clients love, admire, and have found um, great meaning in respond to a fellow survivor in a way that either feels familiar or incredibly rewounding. And just to second that, I think the concern also that there's so many people who have not come forward. And so when they see the risk now of coming forward and the types of things that might happen, I don't know that we're creating a great context or safe space for people to feel like that's going to go well for them. But yeah, so Jennifer, anything you would add to that as far as your own kind of responses, what you saw the weeks that were, were going on? Definitely what I'm seeing in my work as well as, you know, in the research is, is more often than not, survivors tend to, to blame themselves. And let me also say that if someone's been through trauma, they get to define how they want to be referred to, and that may not be survivor. Um, but that it's really one of the hardest things in treatment is to get them past that idea that this was their fault. Um, and, and we're not creating a culture of consent of, you know, maybe respecting that. And I know that like, I mean, I was just so concerned with this idea of that we're going to bring all this history of someone um, as if, I don't have say over what happens to my body if I've made mistakes in the past. Um, Almost that sense from the, from the church. So I was very hurt and disappointed by that. I would like to think that I have a say in what happens to my body. Um, And when that's not respected, I get to say something about that. So we have uh, several articles that we actually want to kind of cover tonight to help us have this discussion. And that leads right into one of the ones that I found It's actually in the Journal of Aggression, Maltreatment, and Trauma, and it was published in 2017, so fairly recent, and it's called Perpetrator Responses to Victim Confrontation. They have this acronym called DARVO, D-A-R-V-O, and what that stands for is it says perpetrators of violence often use a strategy of deny, attack, 
and reverse victim and offender. So, which stands for DARVO. So, um, and it's interesting because I just had a case come up for me where, you know, there was a victim slash survivor who had confronted an offender in the family and the offender denied that this had happened, you know, just, I don't remember that. That can't be true. And so it was very, very, you know, poignant question to me, is that that typical? Like, is that normal? Like, could it be that they really just don't remember doing this to me, even though it happened repeatedly? And even though they were like, you know, an adult when it happened, right? So we're not talking about like a seven-year-old who touched a four-year-old, right? And maybe didn't remember. We're talking about, you know, like a 20-year-old who touched a seven-year-old, you know, things like that. So this really falls into that pattern and that this is really something that you would expect. Like, I think it's pretty normal to expect a confrontation to not go the route of, oh, you know, thank you so much for bringing this up. I've been thinking about this for a long time. I wish I would have brought it up. I'm so sorry that that happened, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It really is a culture, I think, for offenders for a variety of reasons, but we don't necessarily have, you know, I mean, there's, there's really big ramifications to admit to having sexually assaulted or sexually abused somebody. And so denying, and then of course, attacking and reversing victim and offender. So what that means is now I'm the victim of your accusation. Does that make sense? You're now attacking me. So now I'm the victim. I'm the, woe is me because I can't believe that you would want to ruin my life, right? Or have revenge on me or do something like this to impact my life. So that's actually a very normal thing that happens. Sarah, you have a comment. And to add on to that, Natasha, one of the reasons that is done is to purposely confuse, belittle, and then silence the victim. Um, We often see this within the narrative of survivors or victims coming forward within, like you said, family dynamics where the silence would have been preferred versus the dis you know the upset the complex emotions the reality of having to set different boundaries with a family member or even public figure so this is really done to silence it's actually one of the most effective tools perpetrators utilize Um, it's most certainly a fear tactic but it's usually done in I don't remember it's been so long ago why are you bringing this up this is no longer valid why did it take you 10 10, 15, 20 years to come forward. So once again, they reversed the victim offender role to make the person who is a survivor or the real victim feel guilty for coming forward and asking for accountability or justice. That's right. It's yeah. crazy making. It <laughs> may, it's crazy making. And it makes, I think from what we've seen from a public sphere, it makes the public often side with the perpetrator because of anger towards the victim in disrupting a narrative that they have hold, that they have held. And in a way, the public becomes part of this as well. So in other words, like you said, the family member, the church, they also do this deny, attack, and reverse victim and offender, which is actually what we saw our own church do, right? Like, we're not sure this could have happened. We're going to attack the credibility of the person coming forward. Somebody must be out to get the church, right? There's always church haters. So this is just an anti-Mormon type of scenario where somebody's just out to embarrass us and cause problems when, when really there isn't a problem, right? So even though the church didn't commit the sexual assault, they themselves act in the same way. And that's true of family members. You know, I've had so many clients where their own siblings or their own parents or their own cousins, you know, just cannot believe that grandpa could have done this, right? Or the beloved aunt could have done this. And so they come to the defense of the status quo, which is the protection of the perpetrator by using these types of tactics. Jen, I think you had a comment. Yeah, um, just that it's hard um, a lot of times to, when we have loved ones, you know, that we want to defend and we want to help, sometimes it's hard hard for people to believe it, but that's where I think it's so important for us to consult with other professionals and be aware of our biases before we speak out, before we do anything, Um, because we all have those biases. Um, And so we really need to check that. Yeah. 
So moving forward, then, I'd like to go to the document that you brought, Jen, to the table, which it's called Myths About Rape, because I think you're, you know, you're now talking about, so, you know, when family or when people within the system are faced with this possibility or this reality, you know, how, what are some of the things that start happening? Do you want to tell us a little bit about where you found this and yeah. how you use this? Yeah. And let's get into some of the content. This actually comes from a crisis, a crisis intervention textbook that I got um, when I was going to, when I was taking a crisis intervention class in grad school. It's one of those books that I've kept and I've used a lot, um, especially, and I find more than any other chapter, the chapter on rape has been so useful because um, I see that a lot. Um, and I really appreciated the way that this book addressed that because it, it goes into these myths um, and then it gives research of why they're myths. And these are myths that a lot of people believe that are very commonly held, sadly, still. Um, Can you list through those? And then, yeah. Sarah, if you want to comment on any of them. Um, so rape is just rough sex. So that's probably more of an obvious myth. Um, women cry rape to get revenge. We, we definitely know that like the majority of cases, you know, people do not just cry rape. When I've talked to different lawyers that have worked in this area, what they have found um, that when someone really has been raped and brought a case and wanted to kind of stand up, for themselves. Um, in the middle of the case, they often want to get it to stop the case because of how much they're being attacked. And that's so sad to me that, that we're still doing that. Right. Because the other side is trying to discredit their credibility yeah. by you know, making their, their, their story questionable in every way possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which is the perfect example of when the offender I re um, claims the identity of a victim. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? It's a perfect reversal of roles. How dare you accuse me instead of someone being held to justice? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the statistics on this, I don't have them in front of me, but I'm going to just try to shoot them out of my head are, are pretty dire. I mean, it's something like, you know, out of all the sexual assaults that happen, maybe like Oh, I don't know. Is it like in the 20 or 30% that are actually reported or even, and then there's a lesser percent that actually go to trial. And then there's out of those, you know, there might be like one or 2% that actually get some type of legal ramification. Does anybody want to second those kinds of numbers that I'm just pulling out of my hat? I would agree, Natasha. And even on a deeper level, I think one of the reasons I get a lot of people's criticism of how would they not know they were raped? Well, do you know what? We have done a pretty poor job in educating our um, population on what the varieties of rape really look like. It is very often very different than what we see media portray. And so rape and sexual assault can happen in marriages. They can happen in dynamics in which we are not often informed about what rape can and is in real life. And so that's one of the reasons that often even working with sexual abuse survivors, when we look through what they have survived in their trauma narratives, they didn't even know that rape would be the appropriate category or terminology associated to the abuse they've survived. Because rape can feel, look, and be experienced very differently than what others perceive it to be. I'm sure we could do an entire podcast just on that concept. Oh. Do you want to give a brief definition of what we might be talking about there? Or do you mean an example of a misinformation, Natasha, or like a, a case? Yeah, in other words, like what's a typical example of maybe somebody, you know, where you would classify it as a rape, but people mm -hmm. maybe would not know to think of it that way. So for example, let's think about um, college students who are, experience um, experimenting sexually there is a certain level of consent to a certain level of interaction maybe they have are feeling like they're comfortable participating in oral sex or heavy petting or um, making out to a certain degree but do not feel comfortable moving forward into um, intercourse um, 
a sexual experience elevates and intercourse begins without consent, meaning that there is no verbal permission that this is accepted or wanted. There is no conversation um, or permission related to protection or thought of protection. There is a struggle or what I often see is there is a freeze experience where survivors do not know what to do in that circumstance because it was unexpected and unwanted. And so while they didn't fight back, which is often what people think is necessary in order for an assault to be considered an assault. They have a sexual experience that was unwanted and in many ways forced, non-consensual, which would qualify as a rape. Thank you. Okay, do you want to continue with the list, Jen? Yeah. Um, Rape is motivated by lust. Um, We know that often it's about power. Um, So, and then the next one is, you know, rapists are weird, psychotic loners. And this really, you know, often we don't believe people because we're like, well, this person looks normal and they, they're nice and they're, I see good in them. Um, And oftentimes they're very successful members of society and, and actually do, you know, are contributing in, in ways that are helpful in other areas of their life. Right. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Victims of survivors of rape provoked the rape or wanted to be raped. So no harm was done. You know, they must have done something. In fact, it wasn't, um, this might've been about 10 years ago. Um, but I remember talking with someone who with the reported to the police that, um, that they were sexually assaulted um, and the police just said that they didn't have a case because there were text messages of her flirting. So somehow that gives permission. <laughs> yeah. We also hear this narrative regarding what the survivor was wearing and if that invited a sexual experience, regardless if that sexual experience was wanted or consensual. And of course, substance use, right? And time of day and whether you're not, you were at a party. And this was a big, big point of dialogue just a few years ago with the whole Title IX discussion at BYU. Yeah. 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 It's interesting because the research actually shows that there, if anything, the correlation with what you're wearing has, um, you're less likely to get raped if you're not wearing something modest. (laughs) So it's actually, yeah. Anyways. Yeah, because that can denote confidence. It can. And, um, okay. and sexuality, which again, rape isn't always about sexuality. Like exactly. We're talking about it's more about a power struggle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or power dynamic. I mean, yeah. 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 Um, only ba- bad women are raped is the next one. Um, again, you know, we're putting this, the stigma of, you know, the victim or the survivor. And that it's women. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and, and men are also assaulted and raped. So, yeah. And this is a huge issue as well with the transgender community. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're like at a, I think it's seven to ten times higher likelihood of sexual assault and violence in general. As well as the LGBTQIA plus community in general is at mm-hmm. a higher risk for what we know both suicide as well as sexual assault. Yeah. Definitely. Um, real rape happens only in bad parts of town at night and in abandoned buildings um, by strangers who have knives or guns, uh, you know, or, or that are beating the victims. Um, when that's completely false, we know that most of this, these things happen with people that you know. And even the language real rape, right? Because that's, right. that's what really people are talking about. I mean, that's how it's talked about is, was it real or not? Yes. Yeah. Like there's fake rape. I don't know. That's I know. Really problematic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and part of like the, the definition of rapes has, I know in certain states has, has changed over time and therapists sometimes have a different, more realistic, um, definition of it because just because there isn't intercourse sometimes there isn't um i would still call it rape if if someone was having some kind of sexual dysfunction where they aren't able to insert their penis and so that's that's also something that well and that's what happened with the mtc president 
president bishop right that was what was talked about there sarah did you have a comment i was going to say that also i've seen forced oral sex be defined as rape in criminal court cases um in addition i think the narrative of this myth i have seen it happen um where clients are confused that they can be raped by someone that they know because rape has also often from a media perspective been done by a stranger at a party at night in a bush right and so one of the things when i've worked with bishops educating them about the realities and myths regarding um, sexual assault and rape because their narratives are often informed by some not understanding that rape can happen within marriages or committed relationships, or boyfriend-girlfriend situations. Um, And so they also have that, there's been that narrative of like, but they know them. (laughs) Um, Or it was in a situation fully in the day. (laughs) I mean, these myths live and kind of inform oftentimes ecclesiastical decision-making regarding disciplinary hearings. I cannot tell you how many disciplinary hearings I have stopped because the individual was raped instead of engaging in um, a sexual sin. That's right. That's so sad. That is correct. Uh, yeah. Well, and this, this next one is definitely really important. Um, if, if the woman doesn't resist, she must have wanted it. Um, and this really goes, I mean, when we are afraid, we all kind of have a different reaction to that. A lot of people freeze. A lot of people don't know how to to maybe say no. Um, maybe they don't know that they have the right to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and and when you're in that, when you freeze, um, you kind of can't. Sometimes feel like you can't move. It's a very scary thing. And so um, that 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 really needs to be taken into account. And building off of that, Jen, what we've seen with trauma survivors is sometimes a primal instinct of survival kicks in and literally not resisting can save life, reduce damage, and to make the experience go faster or quicker in order to escape faster. I mean, it is a primal instinct. We are wise in our bodies and sometimes not resisting was absolutely the safest, wisest choice that victim could make in that moment to preserve their lives. Yeah. And why also we see anatomical shifts that can happen that have nothing to do with desire. For example, lubrication of the vaginal walls and things that can be actually very helpful for your body to do that to avoid tearing or real damage. And that can be very confusing for victims. Like, why did I have, you know, a a reaction that to me is correlated with desire and part of the self-blame dialogue that often happens. So it's very important to know that, yes, your body, not everybody necessarily has that experience, but if that experience happens, it's part of your body protecting itself in exactly what you just were talking about, Sarah. Thank you. So then further is, you know, I think I'd like for you to just go over the responses, Jen, that are very typical, like what you might expect from somebody who, as far as emotional or psychological responses to having been sexually assaulted, if you want to go through that list. Okay. Yeah. um, And this varies a lot. It's very different for everyone. Um, Many respond, you know, by not having emotion and really just appearing unaffected, you know, just being in survival mode. They may feel humiliated or demeaned and degraded. Um, They may suffer immediate physical or psychological injury, um, as well as long-term trauma. They may not always experience um, impaired sexual functioning. Um, They may blame themselves and feel guilty. I definitely see that a lot. Um, They may experience difficulty relating and trusting to others, especially men. Um, I see this a lot with women that, you know, who actually ask for a woman's therapist. They may experience fantasy daydreams and nightmares, you know, um, about either the assault or, you know, it's kind of interesting how, um, there's a lot of guilt that come with that, but that is, as I'm learning more about this area, it's very normal to have 
a fantasy even about rape after you've been raped. But that's more, that has nothing to do with wanting rape. That has to do with having some kind of um, power over over that happening in some in some way and 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 it probably would mean very different things in different situations but the best way i know how to explain this is that oftentimes our mind doesn't know how to respond to something and one of the ways that your mind can respond is through playfulness so for example when you look at children who are raised in war-torn countries they're usually playing war with each other if you see them in the playground and so play and creativity, is it can be a way that your mind just allows you to process what happened. It doesn't mean that you, that those little kids really want to kill each other or that they really are, you know, it, it's that they're processing their trauma through play. And actually with children, this is an entire like a field of study is play therapy, right? Where oh, yeah. kids come in and do sand tray work or work with water or with art, even with adults, you know, we find things like art therapy and Uh, music therapy, just creative outlets to being able to have more than just the talk type of therapies in place that are more experiential. So fantasy play is actually part of that piece and something that people should not feel any guilt about. And in fact, if you're in a safe current um, uh, environment, I actually, you know, encourage people in a safe way to explore those fantasies. If you have a partner that you can really trust and, and again, have that empowered type of um, narrative now that you did not have during the actual trauma. Yeah, no, I really like that because it gives them a way of having, um, power over, you know, and a say over a situation. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Um, now, some people like really, will, this will go on and they'll still experience this over time, um, that it, they can de- develop ways of recovering. Um, you know, sometimes they might, this might be a long-term therapy thing, but it really might affect them for a while. I do want to add that some hope to getting, getting help with that. Often people are very fearful of going to the police or a rape crisis center you know, and America doesn't always have the best history with that either, even with dealing with rape kits. So um, that can be very scary and something that they would need a lot of support with, I think. Um, Maybe reluctant to discuss the assault with members of their family, their friends and others, um, because they may be rejected and and they may feel embarrassed. Um, And I, I really like the idea of sharing this this list with um just to normalize just how different reactions can be um with the family members of someone that I'm working with that has been raped or whoever they want to be part of their support system. Maybe and, what we'll do is turn this into a PDF file and attach it to the website so that people can access it easily. But yes, yeah, Sarah I would love that. And I, I think if any clinicians are listening right now, Natasha, is there has been because of the negative connotation of police interactions um, in rape and sexual assault experiences, a lot of counties have created the funding for a victim's advocate associated to their precinct or to their general area or county. And so I think if there's any clinicians out there, I would take 15 minutes and Google who is your victim's advocate for your local area, find their name. I've had the opportunity of working with incredible victim's advocate all throughout Metro Detroit with unbelievable results. Love, kindness, strength, and advocacy skills um, to help clients heal and move through the criminal justice system to find um, justice and hold their perpetrators accountable. Yeah, because it's a very intimidating system, even when it goes well, it's just an intimidating process. Jen, you were going to say? Oh, just that I really agree. Um, I've had great experience, you know, with that in Utah, with there being a lot of a lot of support, but most people don't know how to access it. Um, yeah. Good. And the only thing that I would add as far as, you know, uh, all these things that you mentioned as far as typical responses is that there, there's no like time frame to these, right? So for example, you can 
feel like, oh, I'm going along with my sex life just fine. It's not been impacted at all. And then, you know, five years down the road, for some reason, you hit a roadblock that you didn't realize you would hit. Maybe some other thing happened in your life that reminds you, you know, there's all kinds of stuff. Sometimes even things happen like if you have a child that now is the age that you were when you had the assault happen, that can kind of be a developmental reminder. There's, there's all kinds of things. So don't, don't worry or think that you're strange or weird if the time frame of these things are kind of what you wouldn't maybe normally expect. Sarah. I've seen, I've also seen in clients, you know, to psychotic breaks after an assault. So we need to recognize as clinicians that post assault is a really tender time and really making sure our clients are safe. And if they need hospitalization to keep themselves safe, that is something that often we have to make sure we're being mindful of. In addition to that heightened paranoia, heightened needs for safety and senses of control. So they really are trying to hyper protect behaviors that would reduce a a secondary assault or additional assault, even if some of those decision makings are irrational, right? Our mind, body, spirit are trying to do everything we can to reduce harm. And some of those things may not seem rational to someone who's not living in that level of fear. Yeah. Um, One thing that I also have that goes along with this, and I won't necessarily go through these, but um, I, and I think this is also helpful, whoever's going to be in the victim or or survivor support system of kind of what's the following three months of what that may look like. Again, very individual. Um, Some of their critical needs um, and, and that's cause it's going to be hard for someone that's just been through trauma to say what they need, but having this list, you know, then they can say which ones that maybe they need more than others, um, and some critical supports and then connecting them to making sure that, you know, my clients are getting those supports in some way. Yeah. And, and yeah, this is a, this is a very good list. I mean, there's things like even considering, you know, um, whether or not they're in a position to be able to be going to work, again, acceptance practices, having allies and family members know what to expect. And then there's another list as well as part of this document of just critical support systems, you know, that are even more than just the first three months. So, and remember too, that many, many, many people, in fact, I would say the majority of the clients I have worked with within the first three months tell nobody anything somebody may stay silent for decades. That has typically been more of my experience. So if you are supporting somebody who, for whatever reason, was able to share this, you know, in those critical first few months, in a sense, that's a real privilege to be in a position to be able to support somebody in that very critical time. Sarah. And in one of those critical times, we need to recognize that if you are ever victimized, making sure that if you are capable to not shower or remove clothing or keep clothing or bedding or whatever surroundings that are possible, it actually aids your ability to pers- um, to to bring forward justice to your perpetrator. And so oftentimes one of the most devastating things is out of safety and comfort, clients choose to shower and unfortunately rid themselves of evidence that could have been used in court. And so if anyone out there ever just having the knowledge of as quickly as possible, get help and do not remove any items from your experience or your body as possible. Those will be taken from you um, and used as evidence. And I've actually watched um, that evidence be able to be used criminally to um, validate sexual assault, even from unknown perpetrators. I've watched, I've watched it work. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. And that can be really hard because like you said, you know, you want to comfort self comfort and oftentimes you want to rid yourself of feeling, you know, that presence on you, right. Or anything like that. So that can be a really hard thing to do. And whenever we say these kinds of things, I'm always cognizant of people who will hear that and go, I, you know, I did not do that. And that's okay. That is okay. Cause Again, we do a really poor job of educating people. And so we never want you to feel ashamed or upset or sad that you chose a different path than what we're recommending right now. And for the rest of us, it's just really good education. It's just really good to know 
just like you, you know, if you're in a car accident, here's the insurance card number that you call, right? Like we have protocols in place so that you know how to manage an accident or a crisis. With sexual assault, we do a very poor job of helping people know what they should do afterwards. And so Sarah is absolutely correct. And if you can get yourself to an emergency room, most hospitals that I'm aware of have people who are trained specifically to help you with this particular emergency. And they will usually do a very profoundly good job of honoring your space, honoring what's happened, and they're trained specifically in helping you in supporting this type of, of emergent concern. Jen? Yeah, um, um, most, yeah, like you were saying, most hospitals do have excellent um, crisis therapists that really specialize in this and do a really good job. Um, I will say that I really, after having anything happen to you that you had no say over, um, I, I think you get to have a say of what you want to do after that and how far you want to do that. I agree. And it's important to be able to have people that if you want to do something about it, that those people, so if you are a friend of someone, say that if you want to, I'm willing to support you in this and to go with you and to do what I can. Um, because it's, you know, so that they have that choice, but they're also don't feel guilty because I hear so often at the comment of, oh, well, if you don't report it, then you're accountable for all those other people that are raped. And I'm like, you know what? The person who's doing the raping is the one that's accountable not any of the people that were harmed. That's right. I couldn't agree more. So we cannot. Yes. Go ahead, Sarah. So where, what we need to be doing is better educating ourselves, our youth, the entire population on appropriate protocol um, or different options in protocol. If there, if someone experiences and survives a sexual assault and yet I echo what Natasha said, this is not a shaming space. We are often doing the best we can with what we know. And whatever decisions you make are yours. And we do not want to create any shaming language or experiences surrounding that. So thank you for that reframe, Natasha. Yeah. And like we've mentioned, you know, people can be really afraid of the consequences or having to be questioned, you know, or having to relive things. And that's why, you know, you survive, even if you do know this information (laughs) and you choose not to go to the emergency room, that's your choice, right? I mean, even with preparing for this Protect LDS Children March that I did, I got so many messages saying things like, thank you so much for going and for marching. I'm just not in a position where I feel like I can do anything like that publicly, you know, and over and over again, I was just saying things like, that is okay. Like I could almost feel some shame in that. Like I'm not strong enough or I'm not good enough or I'm not to be able to do that. And I'm like, you know what? That is you survive the way you survive and I'll survive the way I survive. Right. And, and if those ways are different, well, good. Cause then we have some diversity in the group, Sarah. I also want to validate that sometimes even coming forward with a sexual assault is not realistic based on the safety of the situation. If the perpetrator is either an individual in a power position, a parental position, a position of authority, even just by an age difference or a family member. So it isn't as simple as get yourself to an emergency room, because if you are within a dynamic that you don't even have someone to drive you to the emergency room, because the person who would drive you is a person who's perpetrated trading you. I want to recognize that there's even some privilege associated to having the freedom or the capability to seek help in that way. Thank you. And I know that when I worked with heroin addicts in Detroit, it was extremely frustrating when, you know, the reports were of police authorities or things of that nature. And again, the credibility of a heroin addict, you can imagine, right? And so there's a huge amount of privilege and concern there in regards to the dynamics that we have going on in some of our communities. Yes. I couldn't agree more. So Sarah, you brought an article to the table that had to do more with kind of starting early, right? Prevention and talking to kids about consent. And kind of like you mentioned, I think at the beginning, creating a consent culture. So there were some ideas that maybe I'd like for you to kind of get us going 
on that that we can end on. I would love to. I really try to make sure that I'm contributing skill-based and strength-based perspectives as a community. What can we talk about? So what do we do now? And oftentimes our greatest level of an influence of control is within our own families, within our own communities. Um, if you yourself aren't a parent, maybe you're an aunt or an uncle, or you are a really good friend of children, or you are a teacher in the school or experience mentorship. So I want to make sure we're not just talking about the parent-child relationship, though a large portion of this conversation is off of a five-point kind of tips on creating better consent with children. And so I want you to just mindfully consider who are the children in your life. Maybe that's the Sunday school class. Maybe that's your own child. Maybe that is um, within your community or your school. So all different options and ways that we can support teaching consent. And consent, often Natasha, just like sexuality, is not a one-time conversation. That this is a conversation we have from the beginning at age-appropriate levels throughout the lifespan. So number one, the number one tip suggested, and this is from everydayfeminism.com, and we can include the link um, when we post the podcast. One is teach them how to ask for consent. Once again, how we teach children is typically based in modeling. So when we ask our own children or the children in our lives, is it okay if I put on your shoes and touch your feet? Is it okay if I give you a hug? It is asking permission for physical content contact or any type of interaction with a child. Is It is practicing modeling permission. Consent is about giving permission. It is asking the other person to validate if an activity is or is not okay to participate in. So the most common phrase is, is it okay if I dot, 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 before touching another person um, or attempting to help them understand consent. So it's just giving them language, modeling that behavior. It's asking permission first. Um, it's kind of the beginning of how we begin talking about consent. Any thoughts, ladies? Well, I know I get a lot of practice on this with three boys who like to, you know, pass each other in the hallway and slap each other in the head or, you know, like elbow each other on the side. And, you know, and then one of them is squawking and then the typical, what? I only did this, right? What? What's the big deal? And boy, do I start seeing lots of opportunities in my own household, right? To, first of all, you absolutely have a right to squawk. And it's interesting to see kids, you know, in the snitching type of concern, right? That, oh, well, now you got me in trouble. And, and so now, you know, you're getting the glare from the sibling who says, you know, you're going to be in trouble later type of, you know, dynamic. So these are all dynamics that I'm calling out on a regular basis that, Snitching is okay. Walking is okay. Uh, you can't minimize whatever you did, however minor it is, or however minor you thought it was, if it caused any level of discomfort, even if it was just annoyance. Yeah, lots of opportunities. Anybody want to come over and help me out? You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that's one thing that I've, I've had the opportunity just as an aunt to really, um, talk about with my nieces and nephews, you know, any time that they're, you know, parents like, Oh, give aunt Jen a hug. You know, I'm like, you know, I would love to give you a hug, but that's your choice. That's up to you. You mm -hmm. get to have a say in oh, what happens to your Jen, body. you are an ideal aunt. This is one of the best ways that we can start teaching children about that their body belongs to them and they get to dictate who touches them and how. And no one gets to trump their permission, even if they're grandma or grandpa or Aunt Jen, or Aunt Natasha, or mom, or dad even, right? And so oftentimes this, as a parent, when a child says no to a physical form of affection towards a family member, there's a kind of this immediate kind of like mom guilt dilemma, like, no, 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 give grandma a hug, say goodbye. And yet you are modeling unintentionally some real confusion about whose decision making trumps 
the child when it comes to their body. And so, Jen, I love that even though it's a really innocent request to give Aunt Jen a hug, that you are redirecting the child to create a moment. And this is what consent is about. It is practicing the moment where a request is made, asking yourself if that is what you want, and having the opportunity to voice what is truly what you need. Like that is the beginning process. So if we can't say, you know, to Aunt Jen, no, I'm not really into a hug right now. How hard do you think it is going to be for children to, in a power position, say no to an inappropriate touch with someone in authority, right? Like these are the skills that we're just practicing and learning together. And it's also a very friendly diplomatic way to kind of indirectly address the parent, right? Because if in that moment you're like, you really shouldn't be telling your kid to hug me like that. <laughs> that may not go over yeah. super well, unless you're really close. Probably not. <laughs> I could probably get away with saying that to some of my siblings. But, but that's a nice way to kind of remind everybody in the room in a diplomatic way that you're modeling not only to the child, but also to the adult who requested, who made this request on behalf of their child, that, hey, when it comes to me, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to also consider your child, not just your request. Yeah. And actually, like, I mean, there, that's really helped some dialogue, um, you know, where, you know, um, I've had them thank me afterwards of, you know what, I really, I, this is really getting me to think of consent in a different way. And I want to make sure I'm teaching this and I want to involve you and, you know, and then they ask questions and it's, a great experience. And this goes straight into number tip number two, letting children and youth know that consent can be given or taken away at any time. So just because, you know, Johnny really loves giving grandma and grandpa a big hug and kiss, you know, in his early years, and that felt really good. The fact that that's not what he wants to do when he is 11 or 12, totally fine, totally normal. Just because a behavior served us once does not mean we consent to that same behavior the rest of our lives or in the same similar dynamic with individuals where we engaged in a behavior before. And once again, these are just the building blocks for individuals and children and youth to start growing upon as they begin to either sexually experiment, be, you know, begin their intimacy lives, or even just begin practicing, you know, holding hands. Just because I held hands once, doesn't mean I'm going to hold hands every single time, right? That at the basis, tip number two, let them know that consent can be given or taken away at any time, that we have the ability to reflect on what is right for us at any given moment and change our mind. And I think as parents, because, you know, I oftentimes hear people say, yeah, but I want to encourage a climate also of affection, you know, and having kids be comfortable, giving people that they love, affection. And so I I hear that. And one of the ways that I do this with, again, my boys who are older now and are not as adept at, you know, running up and giving everybody a hug because they're in their teens and stuff. And so I'll kind of have a conversation prior. So I'll say, you know, is there anybody in our family that uh, you wouldn't be comfortable giving a hug to, you know, or is there somebody that you'd rather not be in that type of relationship with? And if the answer comes back as no, like, no, I don't care, you know, I'm fine giving a hug, then I might say something like, well, you know, I think it would be really meaningful if you were comfortable to give grandma a hug and to initiate that. I think that would really mean a lot to her. But again, only if you're comfortable. And I'm not doing that in front of grandma, (laughs) where there's this pressure, like, oh, go give grandma a hug, you know, and now there's like this loyalty test happening, right, or something along those lines. So it's a conversation that you can have, where you can model affection and encourage affection, and also model consent, just in even asking the question to your kid to begin with. Because if anybody said, yeah, you know, hugging grandma kind of grosses me out, or I don't like how she smells or whatever. I'm like, okay, well then let's find other ways, you know, that you can be affectionate. And I think building off of that, Natasha, it's important to explain to children that even in the middle of a physical encounter, consent can be removed. And so when we're talking about our teenagers who are starting to date and starting to experience different relationships, that they have the right to change their mind if something, if ever, is uncomfortable or no longer the right choice. We don't talk about that a lot. And I think within Mormonism, where there is a purity-based culture, where sexuality is taught um, as 
only appropriate after marriage. There's this huge gap of conversation about consent because they're just, they're the assumption that it will only be consensual sex happening because it is post-marriage. And the reality is consent isn't just about sexual activity. It is about all forms of physical touch, intimacy, connection, sharing information about ourselves. And so we really, as a culture, fail. We fail our youth when it comes to consent language because there's this assumption that their sexual choices or their physical choices are going to follow a certain path. And as a result, many, many, many of our youth and our children are put in positions that they were not prepared for and did not have the language to navigate because no one is having a consent conversation. Yeah. And going along with that, I think this idea that we tend to be a bit more male centric in prioritizing sexuality. And so I call this the blue ball syndrome mentality that actually is quite common, whether the young man is saying, oh, I'm really almost there. I can't stop or something along those lines, which is completely inappropriate. And we need to talk to our young men about that. It doesn't really matter how close you are or how you know aroused you are. If there's a stop, there's a stop. And of course, that's the same for young women can't use that either. And also for young women who in our culture, again, are oftentimes encouraged to be caretakers, you know, to sacrifice their own needs or things of that nature, because we're going to be the nurturers and the comforters. And so if you have a young man complaining about his blue balls, which quite frankly happened to me several times as a youth, didn't even know what that meant, because again, nobody talked to me about that kind of stuff. Then that almost like that sense of responsibility, like, oh, I guess I have to follow through with this as otherwise your poor discomfort, you know, that now I'm responsible for. These are the types of, you know, when you say things like that, I get maybe a little bit more crass or direct because (laughs) I want people to understand exactly the types of language and conversations that kids are having around these issues and exactly, you know, I guess taking your comment, Sarah, to a whole nother level of description, which I'm sure some people appreciate and some people really don't, but I'm just like, that's what it is. Well, I appreciate it, Natasha, because I think we have to have more candid, descriptive conversations with children and youth about what they'll be facing, what they could be asked to do, and the myths, right, that Jen has, you know, talked about. And, you know, example of that myth and narrative regarding women's inability to let men experience discomfort. <laughs> it's really, really important. And that goes to the, the number three, which is the discuss the importance of no, model the importance of no. Um, we talked about it really great example with, you know, Aunt Jen and being able to allow children the option to say no and then really allow that to be respected. You talked a really great, you know, about giving people permission to engage and disengage. And once again, these are just the building blocks to practice taking into their more intimate personal lives and personal encounters. And so, it, and that's also, we need, kids need language that are appropriate to them. So what are, you know, helping them brainstorm, what are other ways that you could say no? Like, I'm not comfortable with that. Stop, stop now. Um, you're really giving them a variety of language, practicing language, brainstorming language together as a family about consent and no, my body belongs to me. I'm not comfortable being touched that way. Really giving them concrete ways to say no in a variety of ways is incredibly important. A personal experience of trying to practice this in my own life, um, that was kind of interesting because I, I mean, of course, as a therapist, you know, we deal with a lot of some pretty intense trauma. Um, and so it was one of those things that like, should I even be upset about this? It's so minor. Um, but the core idea that we really, it's okay for us to say no, and that should be respected. Um, and I'm definitely someone in my personal life, you know, I love to uh, give give hugs to family and, and all that. But there's definitely certain settings where I don't feel that's appropriate. Um, and I was in a situation where someone just came up and was giving me a hug and I, I kindly told him, um, no, that's not appropriate. Um, and for him not to do that. And instead of just respecting that, 
he kept his hands on my shoulders and did not harm me in any way, but just looked down at me and just laughed at me and made me feel like, I mean, and I just felt like he, what I was asking was ridiculous for him not to touch my body. So I would reframe that as that was actually very harming to you. So it that was. he, I mean, I know you meant physically harming, right? Yeah, but right. Yeah. That's emotionally harming and belittling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It really just felt like, yeah, it wasn't respected. And think about, I mean, the reality of that was a really appropriate choice to ask for not to be contacted and how hard that was for you to do as a, as a wise, educated adult professional, right? Like practicing saying no in easy situations, we need to practice it also in more difficult situations. And it's a skill set, right? Like this is a, a skill that we have to practice. If not, it's usually uncomfortable. And oftentimes, unfortunately, our youth don't have any practice. And then these situations come up in incredibly uncomfortable ways. And there's no skill set there for them to utilize or call upon. And it's incredibly challenging, you know? And this is why so oftentimes consent is misunderstood. And that's where the next Um, tip is help our youth and children understand the difference between a non-response and enthusiastic consent. And the definition of enthusiastic consent is an active, visible, undeniable yes, right? So this is all about introducing the idea of enthusiastic consent when discussing consent with children can combat some of the ambiguity ambiguity that they may face down in the rest of their lives, right? Like so oftentimes when I've worked with clients, there's been massive miscommunication because it, it began in a gray zone. And it's really hard to understand mixed messages in gray zone. That is not permission for assault um, or a lack of consent. But how do we teach our youth um, and young adults what consent, what consent looks like, sounds like, um, when it is enthusiastic? So we not only how to teach them to say no, but also to identify and to talk about yes. Yes, I'd be happy to give you a hug. Yes, I'm really comfortable with holding your hand. Yes, I'd really like to kiss you back. You know, like how are we practicing giving them the language and permission to to utilize their voice in their lived experiences? And one thing that I'll just go back to the last point that Jen was kind of alluding to that I hear a lot was my trauma, trauma sufficient. (laughs) In other words, do I have a right to be upset about this? Like this wasn't the rape in the alley, you know, with the gun to my head. And so should I be having the reaction I'm having and almost the self-shame of I'm making a bigger deal out of this than I should be, or what's my problem or things of that nature. And I just want to second that, you know, I think it's really important to trust your body and your emotions and your feelings and all of those things that if your system is telling you, Hey, something happened here and you have a right to be upset about it, to trust that and believe that in yourself. Yeah, no, I really appreciate you saying that. And it's what something I always say, you know, is our feelings are always valid. And I certainly need to to make sure that I'm also applying that to my feelings are valid, you know, and what are they telling me? They're not always logical. (laughs) There's no trauma measurement stick, right? Where you get to say that that counts and that doesn't. So exactly. Tasha, one of the things that I've heard that people have used to discount their trauma is if they didn't vocalize no right? And we need to demystify that. We need to make sure that we are explaining the difference between yes and no, and that a lack of no is not the equivalent of yes. And Jen, what you were just talking about, about how we as adults need to own our own rules and our own awareness is the same with consent. We need to be teaching our kids and our youth and those around us, including obviously adults, because adults can have inappropriate boundaries as well, is to learn the appropriate way to interact with their own interpersonal relationships. So are we modeling consent in our own relationships? Are we modeling consent in our relationships to our children. So we're not just teaching them how to behave with others, but we are modeling how that behavior looks, sounds like, feels like in our own home. 
All right, great. Did we go through all the points that you want to make, Sarah, or is there one more? There's one kind of caveat at the very end, which touches about permission rather than forgiveness. So conversations about consent, especially if those conversations are with children, are not always easy to have. However, they're incredibly necessary. And it's important that these begin, we begin having these conversations with children really young. Um, and if there's, there's no shame or guilt associated to this. So if you have young adult children or teenage children and you haven't ex- talked about consent before start now there's n- no shame in this game let's work with where we are and um, what skills that we can build upon and really that it's really all about how do we give ourselves permission as adults to re-enter and can have these conversations on a consistent and regular basis and it, Once again, Natasha, this is a skill set. It can be incredibly uncomfortable. And if parents are needing help learning how to have these conversations with children, seek help, get coaching, learn some advocacy skills, read some articles or some books. We are not just naturally prepared to have these conversations. And I think oftentimes as parents, and I am one, we feel guilty when something doesn't come naturally to us as a parent. But guess what? Ed, this is education. You wouldn't learn a foreign language without some real effort, right? And some support in doing so. The same as talking about things that are foreign to you and your narrative of talking to your children, if that's consent or sexuality or sexual orientation. It's okay not to know. What's not okay is to not say anything, right? So we need to step into that empowerment. We need to get the tools necessary to help our children and help ourselves be as healthy as possible. And I think as we have modeled in our, (laughs) in our own storytelling, that we all struggle or we're all, you know, navigating a lot of these waters ourselves in our own personal lives. And I always tell parents, one of the other ways that you can role model is to take responsibility and apologize. It's okay to say to an 18 year old, you know what? I'd like to sit down with you and have a conversation that I think I probably should have had with you since you were three or four and I didn't. And so I'm sorry that, you know, in in that regard, I wasn't maybe informed at the time to be able to do this and I want to do it now. You know, that can be a really powerful moment as well to role model other skills. (laughs) So I love that. I love that. Yeah. All right. So closing thoughts from both of you, because I think that this has been really an excellent discussion so far. Jen, do you want to go first this time? Just, this was pretty much all covered, but um, this idea of creating a culture of consent, just to quickly summarize what we've already said, that consent is active, um, you know, it can change, and that yes means yes, um, not just whether or not someone says no, um, that it's based on equal power, which that won't always be perfect, but if, is someone afraid? Is someone bigger? Does someone have a higher position or sleep? That there's choice involved, um, that, that, that someone feels free to say yes or no without pressure. Um, and that is a process and it's ongoing. And in our conversations and our relationships, we need to continue to have that conversation on what we're okay with and what we're not because it changes. Thank you so much, Jen. Great, great recaps. Sarah? Mm -hmm. For me, it comes down, you know, Natasha, that consent matters. Our stories matter. Our trauma matters. And it matters that we deserve to be believed and supported and coming forward with our truth. Um, So I want to make sure that we as clinicians and as a community and as a culture continue to grow in our ability to sit in the discomfort of often other people's truth because it challenges previous narratives of who may or may not be safe. I want us to be empowered as a culture and a community to look at ways in which we can protect ourselves, protect the vulnerable, and protect our children and youth in much healthier, safer, and informed ways. And as parents or as guardians or as aunts or uncles or anyone who's in a position of importance in youth and children's lives, we got to get educated we got to build these skills and we need to make sure we're doing our very best work and protecting ourselves and those we love. Excellent. Yeah, I couldn't second any of those things better. I think for me, it's extremely devastating as I'm sure it is for many when these things happen in our own homes, in our own communities and in our own tribes. 
And that's how I have felt these last few weeks, you know, watching some of the things happen within our own Mormon home, our faith community that I care very deeply about. And so I, I really hope that we can call ourselves to do better. We are, for the most part, a highly educated population in Mormonism. We have many, many assets and resources. We really come with a lot of privilege in regards to the membership, at least in the United States. And we need to use all of those things to really help us be much better equipped, much better equipped to protect our youth, to protect our children, to protect our victims and survivors who are adults, to really create the types of cultures that you, Sarah and Jen are talking about. So can't thank you enough for such an important discussion. I hope again that listeners, you can find value in these types of conversations and dialogue and the types of professionals and individuals that I bring on the show to really help us create better cultures of consent, better cultures of health and mental health and relational health and sexual health, all these things that really matter to me. And I know matter to most of you. So again, please help the show out by being willing to offer a donation if that's a possibility for you. It really means a lot to me when when people value the work that we're doing here at Mormon Mental Health Podcast. And thank you for all of those who already support this in one way or another. Sarah and Jen, again, I can't thank you enough for your time. I know we went over what I had uh, asked you to, <laughs> to provide as far as your time. So thanks again so much for such a valuable discussion. You're welcome. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you. We took the long road home Turned minutes into miles And as the evening traveled on Sunset bathed your smile. We stopped beneath the desert stars, wrapped in each other's arms. Was as simple as I love you, an ordinary, extraordinary. Sometimes we fell apart We always came back home Was as simple as I love you An ordinary, extraordinary